most people are afraid of the dark. And while this is something that we expect from our children, adults hold on to that fear just as tightly. We simply don't talk about it anymore. But it's there, lurking in the back of our minds. Science calls it nyctophobia. It's the fear of the dark. And since the dawn of humanity, our ancestors have stared into the blackness of caves, tunnels, and basements with a feeling of rot and panic in our stomachs. H.P. Lovecraft, the patriarch of the horror genre, published an essay in 1927 entitled Supernatural Horror in Literature. And it opens with this profoundly simple statement. The oldest and strongest emotion of mankind is fear. And the oldest and strongest kind of fear is fear of the unknown. People fear what they don't know, the what if, and the things they can't see. We humans are afraid of the dark. We're afraid that our frailness and weakness might become laid bare in the presence of whatever it is that lurks in the shadows. We're afraid of opening up places that should remain closed. We fear what we can't see, and sometimes for good reason. I'm Aaron Mankey, and this is Lore. Nothing can be as isolating or confining as the woods. They seem to cut us off from the rest of the world, leaving us alone, balanced on the edge of being lost. Even in these thoroughly modern times, the woods seem to exist as a reminder that so much of the world is outside of our control. Sure, we could stay on the path, but those narrow routes between the trees only give us the illusion of control, like a trail of breadcrumbs. They're fragile and fleeting, and somewhere in the back of our minds, we understand that if we were to leave the trail, we would be stepping into the unknown. The woods hide things from us. For centuries, criminals have used the dark cloak of the forest to conceal everything from bootlegging and poaching to drug use and murder. They hide wildlife from us and instill just enough doubt and mystery that we end up believing that anything could be living out there. Anything. Some areas, though, are darker than others. In some places, the woods are more than just a gathering of trees and undergrowth. There are locations in our world that are consistently avoided, plagued by rumor, and dense with fear. To step into one of these places is to abandon all safety, all reason, and all hope. Between the three Massachusetts towns of Abington, Rehoboth, and Freetown exists a triangular slice of land that has become home to hundreds of reports of unexplainable phenomena. It's known as the Bridgewater Triangle, though some call it the Black Triangle or the Devil's Triangle. Now, it might not be swallowing up fighter jets or colonial era ships like the Bermuda Triangle to the south, but its history is just as storied and mysterious. One of the areas inside the triangle is the Hockmock Swamp. It's a 17,000 acre wetland near Bridgewater, Massachusetts. Now in the 1600s, it was inhabited by the Wampanoag tribe of Native Americans, and the fort that they built inside it became a strategic location for them during the King Philip's War of 1674. One legend details how during this time of upheaval and invasion by the colonials, a powerful artifact was lost in the swamp. I can't find much beyond a small Wikipedia entry, but the story basically goes like this. There was an object known as the wampum belt, and during the war, it was lost. And as a result, the swamp has become home to restless spirits. Ever since, the swamp has been the source of nearly an endless supply of unexplainable sightings. One of their most dramatic and best documented of those was made by a local police officer, Sergeant Thomas Downey, 
According to him, on a summer night in 1971, he was driving toward the town of Easton, near a place known as Bird Hill, that sits on the edge of the swamp. Now, as he approached the hill, he saw an enormous creature, a winged creature. He claims it was over six feet tall, and that it had a wingspan of nearly 12 feet. I want to point out he saw this near Bird Hill, and I have to wonder what's going on there. Um, after reporting the sighting to the Easton police, he quickly earned the nickname, the Birdman. Now, I, I don't know about you, but it seems odd that a police officer would risk his reputation among his peers on a fake story just to make something up. Uh, clearly, he saw something that night. Just what that thing was, of course, is still open to debate. Now, decades earlier in 1939, the Civilian Conservation Corps were working on the edge of the swamp near King Philip Street. While there, workers claimed to have seen a huge snake, as big around and as black, they say, as a stovepipe. That's big, if you've never seen a stovepipe. According to the report, the snake coiled up for a moment, raised its enormous head, and then vanished into the swamp. And, of course, what wooded area would be complete without Bigfoot sightings? Although tall, hairy creatures have been sighted dozens of times over the years in various parts of the Triangle, the most common appearances have been near the swamp. In 1983, John Baker, a local fur trapper, had one such experience. He was on his canoe in the swamp when he heard a splash. He turned to see, and I quote, a hairy beast slog into the river and pass within a few yards of his boat. Before that, in 1978, a local man named Joe DeAndrade was standing on the shore of a pond called Clay Banks. He claims that he turned and saw what he described as, and again I quote, a creature that was all brown and hairy, like an apish man thing. Oddly enough, I went to high school with a guy who fits that description. But there's been more than just weird animal sightings in the swamp. As far back as the late 19th century, Locals have reported seeing unusual lights. One report was made by two undertakers who were traveling past the swamp on Halloween night in 1908. They claimed to have seen a light that hovered in the sky for almost an hour. Now whether the reports of creatures and lights are true or not, it might be worth mentioning that the word Hockamock itself literally means the place where the spirits dwell. Another hot spot in the southeastern corner of the Triangle is the Freetown State Forest. If all the stories are to be believed, it's the quintessential haunted forest. Deep inside the park is a cliff known as the Ossinet Ledge that looks over an old stone quarry. There have been reports of hauntings near the ledge, of visions, and ghostly figures. Some stories tell of a woman in white who lingers near the precipice. Others claim to have heard voices while visiting there. The most common report is of mysterious lights, though. And some researchers think they know exactly where the lights come from. They're the tools of a creature known as the Pukwudgie. It, I know, right? In ancient Wampanoag folklore, bear with me, the Pukwudgie is a small forest-dwelling creature something like a troll or a goblin. And it lives in the wooded areas around places like the swamp. Now, aside from having one of the most entertaining names in the world to say out loud, uh, they're said to be small, hairy creatures, human-like, three feet tall, who hide in the woods and cause trouble for those who discover them. What kind of trouble? Well, the folklore tells of how the Pukwudgies use lights to lure travelers into the woods, where they would then kill them. These lights, according to legend, are known as the Taipei Wankas, the Native American version of our English will-o'-wisp, or ghost lights. The Pukwudgies use the lights as bait to lure people to their death, rather than attacking hikers outright. Apparently, these creatures prefer to let the land itself kill their victims. Coincidentally, one of the most common experiences reported by visitors to the ledge is an overwhelming urge to jump normal, healthy people have felt nearly suicidal standing atop the ledge. 
Many of them claimed that on approaching the edge of the cliff, they felt an almost uncontrollable desire to jump into the dark, rocky waters below. The Berkshire Mountain Range in Western Massachusetts here sits in the very top left corner of the state. Now, it's not the Rockies by any stretch of the imagination, but in 1851, those hills were in someone's way. The Troy and Greenfield Railroad Company wanted to lay some track that would cut through the mountains, and so they began work on a tunnel. On the western end sat the town of Florida, and North Adams holds up the eastern end. And between those towns was about five miles of solid rock. Now this building project was no small undertaking, no matter how unimpressive the mountains might be. It ultimately took the crew 24 years to complete the work and had a total cost of $21.2 million. Now, $21.2 million doesn't sound like a lot today, but in 1851 dollars, that's $406,493,000. See, this was a big deal. Now, monetary costs aside, construction of the tunnel came with an even heavier price tag. At least 200 men lost their lives cutting that hole through the mountain. One of the first major tragedies occurred on March 20th, 1865. A team of explosive experts, and I use air quotes. Can you air quote air quotes? I don't know. I use air quotes because nitroglycerin had just gotten into the country, and people weren't really experts at it yet here in America. But these experts entered the tunnel to plant a charge. That's how they worked. And the three men, Brinkman, Nash, and Kelly, whose first name, by the way, was Ringo, which I think is just fantastic. <laughs> they did their work, and then they ran back down the tunnel to their safety bunker. Only Kelly made it to safety. It turns out that he set the explosion off just a bit too early, burying the other two men alive. Naturally, Kelly felt horrible about what happened, but no one expected him to go missing, which he did just a short while later. Poor Ringo. But the accidents didn't end there. See, building a railway tunnel through a mountain is a complex project. And one of the most important features of a tunnel like this is a ventilation shaft. Constant coal-powered train traffic moving through the tunnel creates a lot of smoke and fumes. And so engineers thought it would be a prudent idea to have a ventilation shaft that ran from the tunnel to the surface above. Now this shaft would be roughly 30 feet in diameter and it would eventually extend the thousand feet that covered the surface to the tunnel below. And by October 1867, they had gone 500 feet. They're halfway there. It was essentially a really, really deep hole in the ground. Now to dig this hole, they built a small building on top of it with which they used to raise and lower a hoist. It was like a little house, an outhouse. And then they lowered a dozen crany Cornish miners, not kids, but the people who work in mines, into the hole, and then they set them to work. You see where this is going, right? Please tell me you see where this is going. <laughs> On October 17, a leaky lantern filled the hoist house with uh, a gas called naphtha. It's a flammable natural gas. And the place blew sky high. As a result, things started to fall down the shaft. What things? Well, for starters, 300 freshly sharpened drill bits. And then the hoist mechanism itself. And finally, the burning wreckage of the hoist house itself. And all of it fell five stories down and onto the 13 men who were working in the pit below. And because the water pump was destroyed when the explosion happened, the shaft also began to flood. The workers on the surface tried to reach the men at the bottom, but they failed. One man was lowered into the shaft in a basket, but he was pulled back up when the fumes became unbearable. He managed to gasp the words, no hope, to the workers around him before he slipped into unconsciousness. And in the end, they gave up. They called it a loss and they covered the shaft. But in the weeks that followed, the workers in the mine frequently reported hearing the anguishing voice of men crying out in pain. They said that they saw lost miners carrying picks and shovels 
only to watch them vanish moments later. Even the people in the village nearby told stories of odd shapes and muffled cries near this covered pit. Highly educated people upon visiting the construction site recorded similar experiences. Glenn Drowen was a correspondent for a local newspaper and he wrote this. The ghastly apparitions would appear briefly and then vanish, leaving no footprints in the snow, giving no answers to the miners' calls. Voices, lights, odd shapes in the dark, all the sorts of experiences that we might fear would happen to us when we step into a dark basement. Now, a full year after the accident, they reported that they opened the shaft. They drained out all 500 feet of water. They wanted to get back to work. They needed to finish the shaft. But when they did, they discovered something horrific. Bodies and a raft. Apparently, some of the men survived the falling drill bits, the burning debris, long enough that they managed to build a raft. Now, no one knows how long they stayed alive like that, but it's clear that they died because they had been abandoned in a flooding hole in the ground. After that, the workers began to call the tunnel by another name, the Bloody Pit. Catchy, right? About four years after the gas explosion, two men visited the tunnel. One was James McKinstry. He was the drilling operations superintendent. And the other was Dr. Clifford Owens. Now, while they were in the tunnel, the two men, again, both educated, well-respected among their peers, had an encounter that was beyond unusual. Owens wrote down what he experienced. He said, on the night of June 25th, 1872, James McKinstry and I entered the great excavation at precisely 11.30 p.m. 11.30 at night, really? We traveled about two full miles into the tunnel when we finally halted for rest. Except for the dim, smoky light cast by our lamps, the place was as cold and as dark as a tomb. James and I stood there talking for a minute or two. And we're just about to turn back when suddenly I heard a strange, mournful sound. It was as if someone or something was suffering great pain. The next thing I saw was a dim light coming from the tunnel from a westerly direction. At first, I believed it was probably a workman with a lantern. And yet, as the light grew closer, it took on a strange blue color and appeared to change shape almost into the form of a human being without a head. The light seemed to be floating along about a foot or two above the tunnel floor, and in the next instant it felt as if the temperature had suddenly dropped and an icy cold chill ran up and down my spine. The headless form came so close that I could have reached out and touched it, but I was too terrified to move. For what seemed like an eternity, McKinstry and I just stood there, gaping at the headless thing like two wooden Indians. The blue light remained motionless for a few seconds, as if it were actually looking us over, and then floated off toward the east end of the shaft and vanished into thin air. I am above all a realist, he says, nor am I prone to repeating gossip and wild tales that defy a reasonable explanation. However, in all truth, I cannot deny what James McKinstry and I witnessed with our own eyes. Now, the Hussock Tunnel played host to countless other spooky stories in the years that followed. In 1874, a local hunter named Frank Webster just vanished. When he finally stumbled up the banks of the Deerfield River three days later, he was found by a search party without his rifle and appearing to have been beaten bloody. He claimed he'd been ordered into the tunnel by voices and lights. And once he was inside, he saw ghostly figures that floated and wandered about in the dark. His experience ended when something unseen reached out, took his rifle, and clubbed him with it. He had no memory of walking out of the tunnel. In 1936, a railroad employee named Joe Impoco claims that he was warned of danger in the tunnel by a mysterious voice. Not once, but twice. <laughs> 
I, I like to think it was Ringo trying to make up for being an idiot. In 1973, for some unknown and god-awful reason, a man decided to walk the full five-mile length of the tunnel. This brilliant man, Bernard Hastaba, was never seen again. One man who walked through and did make it out, though, claims that while he was in the tunnel, he saw the figure of a man dressed in 19th century minor clothing. Again, not a child, but the kind that digs a hole. He left in a hurry, from what I've read. Stories about the tunnel persist to this day. It's common for teams of paranormal investigators to walk the length of the tunnel, although it's still an active railroad and dozens or so freight trains pass through every day. There are rumors of a secret room, or many rooms, deep inside the tunnel. There's an old monitoring station that's built into the rock about halfway through, though few have actually been brave enough to venture down to explore it. Those who have report more of the same, unexplained sounds and lights. Oh, and you remember Ringo Kelly, our sloppy demolition expert who got his two coworkers killed in 1865? Well, he did show up again in March of 1866, a full year after the explosion. His body was found two miles inside the tunnel in the exact same spot where Brinkman and Nash had died. He had been strangled to death. Simeon Smith was one of the early settlers of New Hampshire in 1772. He built a farm there on the border between the towns of Wentworth and Warren. He held a public office. By trade, he was a tailor, but like a lot of men of that decade, he fought with the Continental Army. Now, it's easy to look back at Simeon Smith as the typical pioneer from the late 1700s. He was patriotic and a stereotypical New Englander. But few people in town liked Simeon Smith. Why? Because according to the local stories, he was a sorcerer. It was said that Simeon would straddle and bridle a random neighbor and then ride them all over the countryside. Just to spite them. When women were having trouble churning butter and it simply wouldn't work, it was because, they said, Simeon Smith was in the churn. How we got in there, I don't know. If children in town behaved badly, it was because he had bewitched them. He could become as small as a gnat and move through the keyholes of your locked doors. He could become larger than a giant and stalk through the forest at night, or so they said. Stories like these were common in early America. They're this weird mixture of fact and fiction, of historical truths and hysterical superstition. And in an effort to explain the unexplainable, sometimes neighbors and prominent figures were thrown under the colonial bus. The era between the mid-15th and late 16th centuries was precarious for many people. It wasn't the age of Harry Potter. Witchcraft wasn't something that was spoken of lightly or with a sense of wonder and excitement. It caused fear. It ruined lives. It made good people do bad things. All in the name of superstition. Superstition was common in the late 1600s. If something odd or unexplainable happened, the automatic response from most people was to blame the supernatural. But most scholars agree that these beliefs were merely excuses to help people deal with neighbors and family members that they didn't like. If you didn't like somebody, it was common to simply accuse them of witchcraft. In the most famous historical example of this, the witch trials of Salem, Massachusetts, we could see a clear pattern in the events. Many of those accused of being witches were wealthy or held religious beliefs that were different from their accusers. Now, once a suspect was convicted, their estate would become confiscated by the court. And in a community that was already known for its property disputes, its grazing rights, and its religious arguments, that was a recipe for disaster. 
What happened in Salem happened elsewhere all around New England, just on a smaller scale. Neighbors accused neighbors constantly. Stories were told. Lives were ruined. It was the way of things, I suppose. Not ideal, but not uncommon either. One story from Exeter, Rhode Island, talks of a farmer who was said to have been carting his lumber to market when a cat ran across the road. For some unknown reason, this farmer immediately jumped to the conclusion that the cat was actually a neighbor of his, a woman who he insisted was a witch. She had somehow transformed herself into a cat in order to meddle in his business. This farmer was fast on his feet, though. Not only did he see the cat running and then make a connection to his witchy neighbor, but he managed to pull out his gun, which was loaded with a silver bullet. This is what the story says, okay? He's said to have fired the silver bullet at the cat, something known very well to be effective at that time. And he struck his target. At that very moment, according to the story, the suspected witch fell in her own home, breaking her hip. Now north in the town of Salem, New Hampshire, a man decided that his cow looked strangely different than it had the day before. Then he made the most logical conclusion that he was capable of. His neighbor was a sorcerer, and the man had bewitched his cow. The folklore dictated an obvious solution. He cut off the cow's ears and tail, and then burned them, right? <laughs> Soon after, the farmer's neighbor was found dead, the victim of a house fire. In West Newbury, Vermont, a farmer had settled in for an evening beside his fireplace. Now, perhaps he was enjoying something alcoholic and refreshing. Maybe he was trying to read a book. But he was there by the fireplace. And while he was there, he witnessed something that he called spectral shapes that danced and moved in the flames. This farmer immediately thought of one particular woman in town, a woman known to be a witch. And he took some tallow and some beeswax, and he fashioned a careful likeness of her out of it. And then he took a branch from a thorn bush and he pierced this little figurine before tossing it all into the fire. At the same time, across town, the suspected witch apparently tripped on her stairs and broke her neck. Now back in the town of Wentworth and our old friend Simeon Smith, he received his own fair share of retribution. It was said that a local boy named Caleb Merrill was struck deaf by the sorcerer. And after that, he began to act even more strange, running up the sides of the house like a squirrel, they said, and writhing in agony. After some trial and error, Caleb's parents put the perfect combination of ingredients into a witch bottle, a sort of homemade talisman that people would make, designed to combat sorcery. And then they buried the bottle beneath their hearth. And soon after, the town was burying Simeon Smith. These stories of neighborhood witches and the ways in which the good citizens of the town defeated them were common across New England. They border on the cruel and they cast these people, often simply the poor or the non-religious among them, in a horrible light. For many people, suspicion was a convenient excuse to hate your neighbor and wish them ill. In no other place was that attitude more pronounced more dominant and more extreme than in the town of Hadley, Massachusetts. In Salem, the townspeople worked within the legal system. And in Hadley, though, the people took matters into their own hands. And the results were horrifying. When Philip Smith was dying in 1684, the town went looking for answers. It was hard to blame them. Smith was a model citizen. He was a leader in the community. He had been a deacon of the church, a member of the general court, a county court justice, and a town selectman. He was respected, trusted, and maybe even well-loved. The sole suspect in the crime was an old woman named Mary Webster. She and her husband were poor, they lived in a tiny house in the middle of some of the pasture land outside of town. Sometimes when things got tough, they even needed assistance from the town. Colonial era welfare, so to speak. 
it was easy to blame Mary Webster. She and Smith had not been on the best of terms, although few people in town were on good terms with Mary Webster. She was cranky, you see. Accounts of the events include almost sarcastic comment that her already poor temper had not been helped by poverty. She was a sour and spiteful woman, and she had a tendency to shoot her mouth off. Okay, a lot. Her fierce temper and stinging tongue had earned her a reputation as the town witch. Apparently, she wasn't much of a churchgoer, and that did little to help her case. But the clincher was that she had just gotten back from Boston one year earlier. Why Boston? Well, she'd been on trial there for witchcraft. She'd been taken to Boston in chains sometime in late April of 1683. Mary, an old woman with a foul mouth, had been accused of having Congress with the devil, of burying his children and suckling them. And these children looked like black cats, they said. She said she was said to have strange markings on her body. It was conclusive and obvious, they said. There were other stories of Mary Webster. It was said that when teams of cattle were driven toward her property, they would panic and bolt in the opposite direction. It was claimed that when this happened, the men would approach the house and threaten to whip her, and only then would she let the animals pass. Once a load of hay toppled over near her home, the driver of the wagon went to Mary's house. He literally went inside her house. He was about to give her a piece of his mind when the cart magically righted itself, or so they say. Another story tells of how she entered the home of some local parents and when she set eyes on the infant in the cradle, the baby levitated out and touched the ceiling. Not once, but three times. There's even a story about some people who were inside one evening. They were boiling water and getting ready for dinner. And all of a sudden, a live chicken came down the chimney and landed in the pot, only to escape the house moments later. The next day, it was discovered that Mary herself had been scalded the night before, and though she wasn't telling people exactly how that happened. So Mary was transported 100 miles to Boston, along with a sheaf of those eyewitness accounts that had been written by her accusers. And she was brought before a jury and judge. And the jury listened. They read those papers. They looked everything over and did their best as impartial, rational individuals. They discussed it among themselves. And when they returned to the court, they had a verdict. Mary Webster was not guilty. Maybe this pissed off her neighbors. Maybe they thought they were finally done with her when she was taken away. I can almost imagine the surprise when she rode back into town, a smile on her face and a fire in her belly. She had beaten the odds. But when Philip Smith, her old adversary, took sick just a few months after her return, that newly won freedom looked like it might be in jeopardy. The winter after Mary's return from Boston, Philip Smith began to look ill. The people of Hadley didn't know what the cause was at first. What they did know was that Smith was in a bad way. He had frequent seizures and seemed delirious most of the time. The people caring for him, his family, his friends, and nurses were all deeply concerned. Whatever it was that he was suffering from, it didn't appear to be normal. In fact, it appeared to be the work of the devil. I mean, what else could possibly cause a man to suffer fits and scream and babble for hours in an unknown language? When Smith could be understood, he cried out that someone was pricking his arms with nails, hundreds of them, over and over, painfully. His nurses looked for the nails, but they never found anything that could be causing the pain. He claimed that a woman was in the room with them, 
Now, some of the young men in town had a theory. They had been talking about it for a while, and they decided that they needed to test it out. You see, they thought that Mary Webster was the person behind his illness. In their minds, they had a way to figure that out. One of the men stayed with Smith, while the others went to Mary's home. Three or four times, they knocked on her door and bothered her, thinking that if she was indeed casting a spell over Smith, this would break her concentration. When they returned, the man who had been tasked with watching over Smith claimed that the sick man was at ease three or four times while they were gone. There were other things that they noticed. The small pots of medicines that had been laid out for Smith were mysteriously empty, as if somebody were stealing the contents of them. They frequently heard scratching beneath the man's bed. Some of the men claimed to have seen fire on the bed, but when they began to talk about it, it would vanish. The details of the events surrounding Philip Smith's illness are rife with superstition and fear. These young men even claimed that something as large as a cat would stir under the covers near the sick man, but whenever they tried to capture it, it would slip away. Others said that the bed would shake enough to make their teeth rattle. All of this was just too much for them. Convinced that they knew who was causing Smith's illness, the group of young men returned to the home of Mary Webster. This time, though, they had more than disturbing her peace on their mind. They dragged Mary from her home and out into the snow in the cold of the New England winter. They beat her. They spat on her. They cursed her in whispers and in shouts. And then they carried her to a nearby tree. One of the men had a rope and he slung it through the branches of a tree while another one fashioned a noose at the end. And right there in the snow-covered field outside her own home, Mary Webster was hanged. When she stopped moving, the men cut her down. They took her body and they rolled it in the snow, burying it. And then they left. They walked back into town back to the home of Philip Smith, back to the others who knew what they had done. And they waited. They waited for Smith to get better, you see, for the curse to lift and for their lives to return to normal. They waited for safety, for their superstitions and their fears to fade away now that Mary was gone. But oh, how wrong they were. The world of the 17th century was tensive and harsh, especially for the people trying to carve out an existence here in colonial New England. The Protestant Reformation of the century before had left most Europeans with the belief that bad things happen because of the devil. Everything that went wrong, and I mean everything, was caused by something supernatural. This was a time when misfortune and loss and even simple illness would be blamed on the work of witches and sorcerers. Because of this, everyone in town was always on the lookout. If something went wrong, there was always someone to blame. It seems like there was a devil in every community. History is full of people who took things too far. The events that took place in Hadley in the winter of 1685 are just one of countless examples of what superstitious people are capable of when their fear gets the better of them. Sadly though, it didn't work. When friends arrived the next day to look in on Philip Smith, he was dead. What they found, though, gave their suspicions new life. It was said that 
His body was still warm, despite the winter cold. That his face was black and blue, and fresh blood ran down his cheeks. His chest was swollen, and his back was covered in bruises and holes from something like an awl or nails. Now they had more questions than answers. Who beat the man overnight? Who kept his body warm against the creeping chill of New England winter? And who put the holes in the flesh of his back while he lay dying in bed? I imagine the people who visited him that morning were disappointed. He was respected by most in town. Many people there most likely depended on him for something. They'd done so much to take care of him, even gone as far as to murder another person, and yet it hadn't worked. Philip Smith was dead, and all they were left with were questions. Something else would soon disappoint them. You see, although Philip Smith had died, Mary Webster hadn't. Even though she had been beaten and hung from a tree before being buried in the snow and left overnight, Mary somehow survived. In fact, she went on to live 11 more years before passing away in her 70s. It turns out that Mary was also an ancestor of the well-known novelist Margaret Atwood. In 1995, Atwood published a poem entitled Half Hang Mary. It was written in sections, each one covering an hour of her torture, beginning with the hanging and ending with her return from the dead. The poem, written from Mary's point of view, ends with a line that makes a person wonder. Before, I was not a witch. Now I am.